Amen. So keep your place there in Ephesians chapter number 6. We will get there in just a few minutes. So tonight we're continuing the Bible Family Sermon Series. What is this series about? This series is about if you applied the Bible to your family, what would it look like? If you just There's a lot of practical application that we're using in this sermon series. We're looking at if we took the doctrines and the philosophies and the ideas that are in the Bible and the concepts in the Bible and apply them to how we raise our children, how we run our marriages, what would that look like? That's what we're looking at in this series. And as I explained to you last week, this is heavy on practical application, and this is heavy on using examples as the Bible um, uses, it gives us examples. Hebrews chapter 11 is the main um, chapter that I use to explain that. Not only did the Bible tell us what faith is, but the Bible then gives us several examples of what that faith looks like in practical application. So faith is, you know, the evidence of things not seen, the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the hope of things, the hope of things not seen, the evidence, uh, I, I'm saying it wrong. But the point is, is we get the verse number one defines what faith is, and then we get the examples of what that faith looks like through people in the Bible, all right? So we're going to use that same methodology going forward. And tonight, you know, I was thinking about where to start as far as the different roles in the family. Do we stop for, start from the top down or go from the bottom up? And I just decided to go with the bottom up, and I think it makes the most sense to do it that way. So tonight we're going to talk about small children. We're going to talk about raising children. And when I say small children, and I'll show you how I define that, I'm really talking about children from 0 to 10 or maybe even 0 to 6 for the, the bulk of this sermon. All right. So what I want to do is before I give you the three things that I want to talk about tonight, I want to give you kind of a pre-sermon on what the Bible says the tools that we are to use to bring up and raise our children. So the first thing I want to look, about, look at is I want to talk about the how. How are we going to implement these things? I'm going to talk about three main things that we need to teach our small children tonight. And then I'm going to, first of all, before we even get into that, talk about how we're supposed to teach those things. All right. Go to Proverbs chapter number 23, if you would. Go to Proverbs chapter 23. So before I give you the, the three-point sermon tonight, on raising small children, I want to give you the how. How are we supposed to do this in um, our, the raising of our children? All right, go to Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs chapter number 23. If you look down at Proverbs chapter 23, the Bible talks about corporal or physical punishment of your children. All right, the Bible points this out in Proverbs 23 and verse 13. The Bible says, Withhold not correction from, again, notice this word. So we're going to see in these verses, we're going to see several clues about things, about the way we're supposed to do this. But the Bible specifically points out, you know, physical punishment or corporal punishment of children. All right. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Verse 14. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. So here we see that we're talking about a child, number one, and we'll look at what that is defined as. And number two, we see that it has to do with delivering his soul from hell. So don't remember, don't forget um, that part there. Now go back to Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter number 13, if you would. Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13, and look down at verse number the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I don't know why I couldn't remember that. But anyway, and there you go. You're straightened out on that. Proverbs 13, 24. Look what the Bible says here. It says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. So here we see, again, calling for corporal punishment or physical punishment of a child. And then we see another clue here where it says, be times. What does be times mean? Well, if you just look at the word, it's pretty easy to just kind of figure out what that means. Time and then be is kind of like, you know, before or earlier in that. It's basically saying, you know, early. It's saying chasten your child with the rod early. What does that mean? When they're young. Okay. It means early on. All right. So this is important. So the Bible is saying, and again, I explained this a couple weeks ago, but the default in the Christian life is nonviolence. The default in the Christian life, James and John are like, let's destroy this city. Nobody listen to us here. Let's just nuke this place. And Jesus is like, you know not what spirit you're of. 
when Peter cut the soldier's ear off. Jesus said, hey, if if you're going to live by that sword, that's how you're going to die. Basically, what Jesus was saying was that, you know, that's not the best use of your life, Christian. So the default for the Christian is nonviolence. We looked at how, you know, there's self-defense. You know, there's there's exceptions. Self-defense is an exception. The Bible clearly teaches that. And then also, chastening your children is also an exception. This is why God has to point it out. God has to tell people this because most people wouldn't do it if they if God didn't say do this, okay? Now, what have we seen so far as far as how to do this, all right? First of all, the first thing that we see is it's about delivering their soul from hell. So it's tied to salvation. It sounds like it's important. All right, it's tied to their salvation. Number two we see is that it's early. And then the third thing that we see is this word that comes up again and again, child, child, child. All right, so that begs the question, what is a child? Or how old are we talking about when we talk about children? Well, turn to Judges chapter number 8, if you would. Turn to Judges chapter number 8. Judges chapter number 8. So the Bible really has three terms when it's talking about the age of people, all right? And there's the first term we've already seen, that is child. The second term that we see is youth, all right? Look at Judges chapter number 8 and look at verse number 20. Judges chapter number 8 and look at verse number 20. Just doing a, just doing a quick study on how we are supposed to teach our children these specific things that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Look at Judges 8, 20. The Bible says, And he said unto Jethro, his firstborn, up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared, because he was yet a youth. So here's this, not, it doesn't say child, it's talking about a youth. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter number 17, go to 1 Samuel chapter number 17, the Bible talks about David when he's about to go and fight Goliath. The Bible describes David as not a child, but it says, He was a youth. Look at verse number 42 of 1 Samuel chapter number 17. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 17, 42, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of fair countenance. So David was, you know, he was described as this, you know, he doesn't look like a huge mean warrior is what the Bible was trying to kind of paint the picture of, but he was ruddy, meaning he was kind of, He was kind of stringy. He wasn't really, you know, bulky. And then the Bible says he's a youth. He was not an adult. So we see that there's children, there's a youth, and then it's pretty clear in the Bible that over the age of 20 is considered an adult. All right, I'm sorry if you're stuck on the 18 thing. It's just not really in the Bible anywhere. All right, and we'll talk about that next week when we talk about teenagers. But my interpretation of this, and it doesn't matter all that much because we're going to talk about you know, um, some other things that the Bible says. But my interpretation of this is a child is less than 10 years old, maybe even younger than that. A youth is probably a teenager. You know, David was probably in his late teens when he fought Goliath. And then an adult is clearly somebody who is considered a man that can be counted to go to war, as the Bible says, of the children of Israel after the age of 20. All right, now look, the example of others, again, my paper airplane, you know, analogy that I gave you the other day is going to be very important in your life when it comes to interpreting all these things. Because it looks like so far there's a lot of leeway that's open here to interpretation. Somebody could come and say to me, well, Pastor Bozarnski, I think that a youth is 8 or a youth is 12. And like, I couldn't point to a Bible verse to say that that's wrong. So practical application and examples is going to really lead you to what's actually true here. All right. Go to Ephesians chapter number six, Ephesians chapter number six. Okay. So the Bible says, if you beat them with a rod, you know, he shall not die. You'll deliver his soul from hell. I'm on my way to Home Depot to get me a rod and I'm going to beat him. That's what I'm going to do. Well, the Bible gives us some more guide rails here. Okay, and I believe that Ephesians, I believe lately in the last month or so that Ephesians chapter number six, these four verses should always be read together. 
One shouldn't just be read to, to say what you want it to say. It should, it should all be taken together because it's super important. There's many different things that are being shown here. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 6, and verse number 1. We're going to look at the whole passage here. Children, obey your parents. So, first of all, that's not all it says. And I have preached this so much on obedience in the Bible and submission to authority in the Bible. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Leadership and authority structures in the Bible, I don't care if we're talking about a marriage with a husband, children, or the government itself, it always puts that caveat in there. In the Lord, as the Lord. A, a wife, my wife is not subject unto me if I ask her to go against the Lord. If I tell her that to do something against the Bible, she does not have to submit to that authority because her authority is the higher power, which is God above me. Amen. Children have to obey their parents in the Lord. So this is why you don't want to be a hypocrite Amen. as a parent. Because that means that you are telling your children to do something and then you are not doing the same and they are going to notice that and they're going to realize that you are not in the Lord. They're going to see this early in their life, all right? Obedience is never, no matter what, in the Bible, ever. Even to the government, it is obey the higher power. If the government tells me to do something that is against the Bible, I do not have to obey that authority. It is that simple. Look at verse number two. Verse number two. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Now look at verse number four. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Don't miss that verse. That is the guide right there. That is the guide rail to, okay, you know, how do I physically discipline my children, you know, however old they are, where does, you know, where is the line? That's the line right there. That's what the Bible is telling you. And notice how it crosses physical discipline with nurture. Those two things go together because the admonition is the things that we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, the three categories that I've broken that down into with four small children. But notice how the admonition and the mechanics of that admonition, that teaching is through, you know, you know, corporal punishment is one of the tools that are at your disposal, the Bible says. But notice how that is combined with nurture. It doesn't say or nurture. It says and nurture. Those two things must go together. And look, you must have the nurture there. And let me just say this before I even get into deep about this children and teenagers next week. There is no perfect parent, including this one. All right? Nobody has done this perfectly. Nobody has executed their role as a parent without making mistakes. But look, I have a secret weapon to cover your mistakes as a parent, and I will explain that when I talk about teenagers next week. Okay? But look, the Bible is saying here, go back to verse number four. You say, what is too far? How, how hard do I spank my children? Do I only just spank them or do I do other things? What do I do? Well, if you provoke them to wrath, it's too far. That's what the Bible is saying. And nurture goes along with admonition. But here's another one, by the way. I'm just going to sidetrack this one real quick. Look at verse number, go to Romans chapter number 13. Go to Romans chapter number 13. There's also this little thing in the Bible saying that we should obey the law of the land, too. I mean, that's just something that we, if, if the law is according to the Bible, we should obey it. And the law does talk about corporal punishment of your children. And I'm going to read you what the law in California is. Guess what? It is not illegal to spank your children. And if somebody asked me if I spanked my children, I would say yes. And I have done that a dozen times to a social worker that was in my house because we used to do foster care 
and you were not able, you were not allowed to have corporal punishment with foster children. So we had to take classes on time out and all these different ways to, you know, discipline children. And look, we, we did it the right way. We, we learned how to do that, and, but the social worker would come into our house and do these little home visits every week or whatever it was. And at the time, I'm not going to mention any of my kids' names. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But they, do you spank your children? I was like, yes. And they were like, rah, rah. Yes. And I was not like, uh, uh. No, I was like, yes. It's not illegal. It's not illegal. Here's what the California law says, okay? But let me read you Romans 13.1. Let every subject be, un let everyone's soul be subject unto the higher powers. Those are like the governments. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So that, you know, as long as in the highest power is God, of course, so as long as the government makes a law that doesn't go against what the Bible tells me that I'm supposed to do or that I have the right to do or that I should do, there's no problem. All right, here's the California law. What does the law say? Under California Penal Code 273D, child abuse is defined as inflicting on a child any cruel or inhuman corporal punishment. So corporal punishment itself is not illegal. Cruel or inhuman corporal punishment, or an injury resulting in a traumatic condition. So those are, those are the two like guide rails, all right? Cruel and inhuman and resulting in a traumatic condition, all right? So that means the corporal punishment is excessive, meaning cruel or inhuman, or it results in a traumatic condition. So, you know, then it lists out what traumatic conditions could be, all right? Spanking a child to the point of leaving a lasting mark or injury, Spanking a child severely and frequently to the point that the child displays emotional problems. Hitting a child in the face or head. Threatening a child with physical harm. Could cause, you know, emotional traumatic conditions. And let me just say something. I'm good with this. I'm fine with that. No problem. Okay? And I'll explain to you why I'm fine with that. But let me just say this. A lot of people would say, well, that's pretty broad. They can, you know, that's con traumatic condition. Let me tell you something. Most adults that have trauma that they're suffering from, it is from something that happened to them when they were a child. Like to say that like just traumatic conditions are not real or it just to downplay that is ridiculous. I, you know, most adults that are, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old that have issues in their life most adults that I've counseled and helped has been from things when they were a child. This is real. Trauma can happen to children. And look, I'm good with this definition. And as a matter of fact, I mean, it wasn't California, it was Texas, but I've literally just said, yes, I spanked my children. No problem. There's no, it is not illegal to spank your children. All right? So let's put it together. Let's do a summary so far of what we've seen. Corporal punishment, what does the Bible say? It says, do it early, meaning early in their life, okay? It says there should be nurture that goes along with that. There's the law, no injury or, you know, emotional injury um, as well. It's not illegal. And then number four, it should not provoke to wrath, okay? So you say, how do you provoke a child to wrath? I mean, the short answer to that is you raise them in wrath. You remove the nurture, and you only have the punishment. And then you will provoke them to wrath. I mean, look, angry kids, mean kids, these kids, it's, it's because they come from an angry home where there's, not, there's no nurture. That's many times why you see that, because what people do when they're being beaten on by somebody is they find the next person weaker than them, and they beat on that person. It works that way with children. It works that way with adults. It's the, it's the same theory, all right? So how do we put that together? And I'm going to give you my interpretation tonight before I, even get into, um, before I even get into the three things I want to talk about. The sermon hasn't even started yet, all right? But I'm going to give you my interpretation of how this, how this lays out to me and how we actually did it in our family. So my, air, my paper airplane is this, okay? Here's how you do it. Here's what we did. Spanking, that's it. That's it. 
Spanking kids. You spank them on the bottom, but you spank them on the bottom. Or you spank them on the bottom. There's no hitting bodies, whipping, smacking them in the head, whatever. None of that stuff is spanking. Is, all that stuff is insanity. All right? That's insanity, and that is somebody that's not in control of themselves or the situation. All right? So we spanked. That's what we did. My wife would use a wooden spoon, like, you know, a wooden spoon or a paint stick or whatever. I'm not even against, like, uh, you know, a dad using a paddle or anything like that to spank their kids. I used my hand because I always wanted to know, like, how hard I was spanking the kids, and I didn't, like, want to have something myself. But you should spank them not through the diaper. You should spank them to where they know they got spanked. And it's not going to hurt them because that's where God designed them to get spanked. And it's going to be fine. The kids are all like, oh, man. But look, it, it is something that is, it's not going to hurt the children. And it's not even close to even injuring anybody. It's a nice padded area to get this point across. That's what we did. All right. Now, I've heard some people say and some statements say that as long as you don't break any bones or cause permanent injury, it's not abuse. Now, I can't even imagine the things that are wrong with someone that would say that, that has children. But my thought of that is, you know, you're going to encourage lunatics by saying things like that, first of all. Yep, right. And the second thing is, you will definitely provoke to wrath yep. if that is your limitation. But, I mean, my whole thing as far as my example and what we did in our family, and look, why would you do more? Why? Why would you do more than spank your kids? It, it just, it seems odd to me because you don't need to. So why would you? Spanking works. I believe it is absolutely necessary. It works. It doesn't provoke to wrath. And it should be done in a nurturing way. I'm not going to stand up here and say I was never angry when I spanked my kids either. Okay, but it should be, most of the time, when I, I mean, every single time I came home from work and I had to deliver a spanking, I was not mad at all. I was kind of disappointed that I had to spank somebody at that time. My wife would spank the kids, but sometimes if there was like a really bad offense, it's when your dad gets home. Is it, you know, it's worse from your dad as it should be. But I didn't want to spank the kids, but let me just say this. As somebody who had children in my house who got spanked and then, one that didn't, spanking is so much better for the relationship. Because it's just like, spanked, done, let's go out and get back to our lives. Let's go out and play or do whatever we were going to do that night. It solves the problem immediately. Here's why you're getting spanked. Most of the time, if I would come home from work, you know, and I had to give a spanking, I'm just like, oh, man, what, you know. Here's why you're getting spanked. Spanked, done, it's over. Amen. Hug, all that. All right, look, I'm not saying that I, when I was involved watching the offense happen that I, I didn't, you know, give an angry spanking every now and then, but, you know, that's normal as well. But you should keep the nurture there. It's important. All right? If you provoke to wrath, you say, how far is too far? If you provoke to wrath, you did it wrong. Right. Period. Right. And the point that you need to not forget throughout this entire series is that your kids, no matter how small they are today, will be adults one day. And they will look back at what you did through adult eyes. Yep. Adults that know the Bible. All right. Now, so we spanked. That's what we did. The second point is this. We didn't spank beyond, and I, I interviewed my wife about this, and we even talked to the kids, but I haven't given a spanking for years. We didn't spank the kids past 10. That's kind of the, the age that we kind of settled on. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I did a detailed Bible study to make that decision. The reason I made that decision is because when the kids got to be eight, nine, ten years old, it's like, this is getting kind of weird. It's getting kind of strange, like, yeah, we shouldn't be spanking them anymore. Because look, spanking, spanking is supposed to be a punishment for a small child. It's not supposed to be an embarrassing or humiliating thing for the children. All right? And look, there's other things once they're 10, 11, 12 years old. There's other ways to make corrections at that point. And that's what I'm going to talk about next week. All right? But look, the Bible lines up with it's for children. It's for small children. 
And I mean, I'm talking about like two to six. That's like the, the, that's the zone when kids should be getting spanked, when they should be getting disciplined in that way, all right? But if you get to the point where they're 10, 11, 12 years old, and you're like, they just won't listen to me, let me tell you something, like spanking them is just going to make it worse at that point, all right? Beating them as teenagers is, is just not going to work at all, okay? You say, I have an out-of-control teen. We'll cover that in next week's sermon. All right, so look, it was spankings, and it was nothing beyond the age of 10. And I believe that it was mostly over by probably seven or eight in our family. But everything in the Bible makes sense. All right, you say, what is the point of spanking? You know, how much, when, that's kind of what, the, what we're going to talk about next. We know the how now. We know the how to discipline our small children. We know what the Bible says, how we should do it. And let me tell you something. Most of the people in this church have small children. And don't ever get, before I get into this, I'm going to talk about the why and the when to discipline your children. Don't ever get into this attitude that because my children are small, I have time. The opposite is true. Now is the time when you need to be teaching your kids lessons, these three lessons especially that I want to talk to you about tonight. It is the most critical time. The analogy I've used in the past is that when your children are small, you're, you're like a, it's like a go-kart when you push it to the top of a hill and you just push it over the top of the hill and the go-kart just gets going. And when the children are small, you can make big corrections. You're at the top of the hill. You can make big corrections. It's really easy to make corrections at that point. But as the children get older and older and older, even past the age of six, seven, and eight, that go-kart's going faster and faster and faster. And those corrections that you can make are simply, they're just smaller. As they get older, the corrections are smaller and smaller and smaller. You find yourself with a 13-year-old or a 14-year-old and you need to make big corrections, you're going to be in big trouble. So small children, and what the Bible is teaching us about small children, is key. It is the most important now. You say, what's important? We know how now. Why, do I, why would I spank my child? And when would I spank my child? So I want to give you three things tonight that kids under 10 need to learn. All right, go back to Ephesians chapter number 6, if you would. Go back to Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6, look at verse number 1. The first one's pretty easy. The first one's pretty easy. And I mean, this starts early. Like, as soon as a child can understand what the word no means, that's how early this needs to start. And like, no's a pretty easy word. Kids that are really young can understand what, I mean, when they're walking around, that's it. When they're starting to move around on their own, that's when this starts. Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord. The first thing that they need to understand is obedience. They need to understand that they just need to obey you. And that is why, look, the Bible is so logical. That is why spanking is necessary. Because you can't reason with a two-year-old. Yet you will see people try to reason with a two-year-old all the time. Children can't understand reason and logic. They just need to learn to listen to you. That's it. And that's why that obedience is tied directly to salvation. Because as they learn to listen to their parents, what are you going to be teaching them? What are you going to be teaching them when they're four, five, six, seven years old? You're going to be teaching them what the Bible says, how to be saved, about Jesus Christ, what he did for them. They're going to learn to obey you, and they're going to learn to listen to you when you teach them the Bible. But all these steps of obeying me to do this and to not do that is preparation for you to teach them this. Look, an older child, once they get to be 10, 11, 13, once they're saved, they have the Holy Spirit. They have the Holy Spirit. You have, they understand the Bible because they had the obedience. You see how these things like build upon each other? And once you have that older child, like there's other things you can use there. Their reason can be used there. I don't want to give away next week's sermon, but if you have a 10-year-old that hasn't learned the obedience, you have trouble. You have trouble. 
The second thing they need to learn. The second thing that they need to learn is this. They need to learn emotional control. They need to learn to not be ruled by their emotions. You need to look for reasons to tell your children no. You say, why would I look for a reason to tell my child no? Because they need to understand that when they want something and then they don't get that thing, there's going to be a flurry of emotions that bubbles up out of them, and that can't control them. If you say, well, what, what does that look like? Well, have you ever heard of a temper tantrum? That's what that is. A temper tantrum is a child that just wants something, and their parents say no. And then this flurry of emotions, anger and frustration and all these things comes out. Look, they just have this I want it, desire and emotion, and that needs to be checked. That needs to be checked. It needs to be controlled. They need to learn, you know what, I, I need to wait. Dad said I can't. They don't need to sit there in their two-year-old mind and their three-year-old mind and say, well, um, the reason that Dad said that I can't have a candy bar or another bag of chips or whatever it is is because the calories that I would input into my body would not equal the energy that I am, you know. I mean, they don't, they're not going to do that. They're simply saying, I want it, and I need to have it now. Do you think that this would cause problems in an adult's life that was never taught this lesson? You ever met an adult that throws a fit when they, they can't get what they want? It started when they were two. It started when they were three. Kids need to learn, I just can't have that. Why? Because I said so. Because I decided, I decided we're not going. I decided you can't do that. Even though you did it yesterday, I decided you can't do it today too. That's it. They just need to learn to obey and they need to learn to control the emotional reaction to not getting what they want. A temper tantrum, one of the worst things you could do as a parent is allow a temper tantrum to win because you are literally training them the opposite way. You're training them, you're, you're untraining them to obey. Tantrum, spanking. No, they say no to you, spanking. They go, eh, spanking. This is what needs to happen when they are young. You must win these battles. And look, you will win. There are two, there are three. I mean, if you have to leave the grocery store, leave wherever, it's embarrassing, it takes you more time, whatever, you just have to do that because you need to make sure that you win every single one of these battles because you need to teach them to not be controlled by their emotions when they're three, when they're four, or you are gonna have major problems when they're eight. All of these things build upon the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And if you miss one of the steps, you're going to have uncontrollable problems by the time they're teenagers. Look, it's not a mistake that people tell you all the time, like, man, when they turn 13, they just go crazy. Like, because a lot of people's kids do go crazy when they become teenagers. And like, see you in 10 years or whatever. That's what people joke about and say out in the world and whatever. It doesn't have to be the case. You just have to make sure that you check their emotions and train them to not only obey, but not be ruled by the things that they want and how they feel at that moment. Number three, number three. Now, number three is a, is a character issue, all right? And I really want to just, and I want to talk about a lot of character issues with teenagers, but with the character issues for young children, I really want to just focus on one character issue, all right? And that one is this, to not be selfish, to not be selfish. They, children need to learn to not be selfish when they are very, very young. Because their default mode is what I want. What I want to have right now, whatever. Children need, this is why it's so important that children, you know, have siblings and, you know, when a new baby's born. You know, when a new baby's born, what do the other kids learn? They learn by, like, just by natural, you know, just by natural law, they learn that this isn't just all about me. There's a new baby getting all the attention. That's good for the older kids. That's good for them to learn that, hey, this world doesn't revolve around me. Look, the spoiled child, the child that has never had anyone say no to them, a child must be taught early to, is a child that, look, they only care about themselves. 
And you literally have to teach ch children very young to think about the feelings of other people, especially other children. They need to be taught this. And look, and not be, they need to be taught to not be a jerk to other children around them. It's selfish. Kids that, kids that are hard-hearted have never been taught this. If you turn to Proverbs chapter number 20 or just look at the verse of the week, turn to Proverbs chapter number 20. I was just talking about this um, out soul winning um, with one of the guys yesterday. You can tell, and let me tell you something, you can tell if kids are hard-hearted when they are very young. Very young. And I mean four, five, six years old. You can tell a hard-hearted kid. And that's because they've never been taught. They've never been taught that it's not all about them. Look at Proverbs 20 and verse number 11. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, 11, it says, Even a child, again, young, is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. You can tell. You can tell if you have a hard-hearted kid. You can tell if somebody else's child is a hard-hearted child or if you have a soft-hearted child. They've, if they're hard-hearted, you're in trouble by the time they, they're five, six, seven years old. You have to fix that. And the way you fix that is by teaching them that this world doesn't revolve around them. Teaching them to think about other people. And let me tell you, I mean, you can see it plain as day. These kids need to be taught this. Look, the strong kid, the strong kid can take two roads. The strongest, biggest kid can take two roads. He can either take the road of, I'm stronger and I'm bigger than everybody, so I can take advantage of everybody. He can either go that road, or he can be taught by his parents that, since I'm stronger and since I'm bigger, I have a responsibility to take care of people who are not stronger and not bigger. Amen. Those are two different roads right there, but that road, the good road needs to be taught, to be thinking about other people, to go into situations as a child and not just think what I want in this situation. And that's when you can start explaining to kids when they're five, six, seven years old. And hey, when you went in there, when you went to that party and you just jumped right in front of the line, there was 10 kids that, you know, had to wait. You should be the type of parent that puts your kid at the back of the line. Not this type of parent that is constantly shoving your kid in front and wanting your kid to have the best of everything. You're teaching them that the world revolves around them. It's a terrible thing to teach them. You're untraining them in what the Bible says that they should do. I mean, they should be taught that with their brother and their sister and their friend, that you look out for each other. Amen. A boy should be taught that you don't fight with your sister, you get in fights because of your sister. My dad told me, if anybody messes with your sisters, I don't care what they look like, you go down swinging. And this is why this whole like spousal discipline thing is so ridiculous and why I didn't put any Bible verses in our statement. Because quite frankly, if you have to be, if you need a Bible study on that type of thing, most, most kids, and this is why most men are triggered by this, because most normal men were taught this when they were six by their dad. <clears throat> and quite frankly, if you need a Bible study on whether you should discipline your wife, corporal discipline, or whatever they're calling wife beating these days, I don't want to know you. That's why I didn't put any Bible verses in there. You're like, where's the Bible verse? Please stop contacting me. Go in the woods and start your little commune or whatever that we talked about this morning. But this is where most men figured this out. They learned not to hit their sister. They learned to protect their sister. Let me tell the kids in the room here something. You kids, you kids look around. Look at all the kids in the room here. You kids look around. There's bigger kids in here. There's older children in here. There's youths in here. But you kids are supposed to be looking out for one another. If there's some kid that comes into this church, and look, I'm the boss of this church. If some kid comes into this church and starts messing with one of your friends, you stand up for your friend. You don't go along with that. That's what a coward does. You say something about it. You say, hey, you leave my friend alone. If there's some bigger kid that's picking on a smaller kid, you stand with the smaller kid. That is what a good man does. 
And that's what a good friend does. So you be a good friend in this church. And you kids are good kids. I know your kids. You, I, know that, I know that you kids have good hearts. I'm not trying to yell at you, but I'm just reminding you. I'm just reminding you. There's going to be more and more kids that come into this church, and you remember what I said. You look out for your friends. These kids in this church are your brothers and your sisters in Christ, and you look out for each other. That's your job. You have responsibility even as a six-year-old, even as a nine-year-old, even as an eight-year-old. So kids must need to learn obedience when they're young. They have to learn to control their emotions, and they have to learn that the world does not revolve around them and to think about other people and how other people see situations. So even, look, kids, even with words that you say, you can really hurt other kids. Even with things where kids are joking around, and if you see somebody joking around and maybe they're picking on somebody or, or just saying words, that can be very damaging. You need to stand up for your friends, even if people are talking to them in a bad way. Let me give you some final thoughts on just the, the subject of abuse, okay? Because there's been a lot of talk about this lately. I mean, I'm just, I want to talk about, there's other kinds of abuse other than just physical abuse. One of the things that I was very shocked about when we went through, when we went through training to become foster parents and I was surprised how much neglect could damage young children. That really shocked me. I kind of had this idea when I was in my, you know, mid-20s that no matter what had happened to a child, that if, you know, as long as they were in a stable home, everything would be fine. But even neglect can be abuse. I did learn that. I'll say this as far as, you know, protecting your kids from, I'll just say this word to not you know, hurt anyone's ears, like perversion abuse, that type of abuse, that is super common. It is super common, and you need to protect your children from that. You say, how do I do that? You don't trust anyone with your kids. That's how you protect from that. That's, I mean, it's super common. Relatives, whoever. And it's super common because people just trust people with their kids. And the answer to that one is to just not trust anybody with your kids. Even in this church, keep an eye on your kids. Watch your kids. I'll do my best to keep all the perverts and reprobates out of this church. That's my job. But just keep an eye on your kids in the church. But let me say this. Turn to James chapter 3. And I already kind of touched on this with the kids. But let me talk to the adults about this one. There's another type of damage that you can do to your kids or ways you can provoke your kids to wrath. If you look at James chapter number 3, look at verse number 6. The Bible says this, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on the fire of hell. Look, you can emotionally and verbally damage your kids. There is no reason to be berating your children in ways that would destroy their confidence. And as parents, look, and as parents, I'm, a, I'm imperfect here. As parents, we need to be careful with the words that we say, even when we're upset and we're angry and we're stressed out, because sometimes words can damage our children the most, the things that we say to them. And there can be lasting effects there. Again, your children will be adults one day. Let me end with this. Just the example that I gave you on us raising our small children. I, I mean, I think my children would agree with this, but I was strict. I was, a, I was a strict parent. I was stricter than my wife. And I think that that's a natural thing for the man to be stricter than the wife. But I was strict, and I'm going to get more into this in the teen sermon, but I was strict more in the ways of expectations on, on I could, when I was strict, I was thinking about their future. When I was strict on things, I mean, when, when the young children, the young things, the young child stuff was easy for me. I don't know, it just came natural for me because like, I just wasn't going to put up with tantrums. It's just not in me. How, how parents put up with tantrums and children screaming at them and telling them no and all that, that's not anywhere in my DNA. So I just was never going to deal with that. We shut that stuff down early, 
And you should do that too. Lying was a huge deal to my wife and I. Because when they get to be four, five, six years old, they'll try to get away with stuff. So lying was a huge deal. And guess what? If children lie and they think that they can be successful in lying, that's how you get a manipulative child. You get a child that grows up to be a youth that is just into manipulating people. It's a terrible thing. So look, we never you know, put up with these small children type of things. But the nurture, I will tell you this, the nurture was always there somewhere. It was always there somewhere. I'm not saying I did these things perfectly, and I'm sure my kids would agree that you know, we were not perfect parents by any stretch of the imagination, but the nurture was always there, okay? I mean, the, the guy, there were some guys yesterday that are visiting the church, and what I was thinking about in that laser tag arena when those dads were standing there with their little, with their little kids is like, you know what that is? That's the nurture. That's the nurture part. And I mean, I know we were having fun, and the moms were off doing the nurture stuff with the really smaller kids, but that stuff is so important. I mean, there has to be the good times, too. You know, it can't just be all, you know, strictness and, and all these things. The nurture is extremely important. And look, let me just tell, this, like, tell you this. I'm glad that I had a strict dad. I mean, I had a dad that was, was very strict with me, that taught me, you know, the seriousness of things. And I, am, I mean, that is a great thing. That is a great thing, and I'm very, I'm very thankful for that. But there is a way to provoke to wrath. Through, through abuse of all kinds, folks. And let me tell you something. I've seen it many, many times in just this ministry. Kids provoking their children to wrath. Kids that can't wait to get away. And when they're 18 in one day, they're, they're burning rubber. They're out of here. 18 means nothing. It's nothing in the Bible but it means something legally. And if all you hear is screeching tires, you provoked a wrath. It's a problem. And let me tell you something, and, and it's, it's, it's probably the biggest challenge that I've had in the ministry. If that is the case, I can't help you. And then people get upset at me. But I can't help you if that's the case with your child. There's nothing I can do at that point. I won't be able to fix that for you because it starts when they're a small child. And let me just say, you know, to all the, you know, just give me a minute to talk to the internet people out there for a second. All the people out there that are taking this provoking your children to wrath and making fun of it and throwing it out the window like it doesn't mean anything, I say this out of love for you, the people that are in these churches that are going down this new doctrinal road, because it's new, this new road of consensual punishment of your wife, or I, I, I'm sure I'm getting the terms wrong, and that there's just extreme levels you can put your kids through as far as punishing them, and that's all good, and you're weak if you don't do that. Let me just say something to those people you are marking yourselves. You're marking yourselves. You're marking yourselves to other Christians. You say, Pastor Pazarnsky, we don't care about you or your incredible church. And I think this church is incredible. But let me tell you something. You're marking yourselves to those that are without. But most importantly, and don't miss this you are marking yourselves to your future adult children and you should care about that because this point in time is a marking event and these kids will grow up and they will know what this says and they will look back at this moment that will be on the internet for eternity and they will look back and they will look at the bible and they will look back, and they will look at the Bible and be like, why were we still involved with that? 
What? You're marking yourselves. And I'm, I say this out of love and concern for Christian brothers and sisters. And it's something that I think a lot of people haven't thought about. And I just wanted to put that out there. But look, all of these things build on each other. And the building blocks, the foundation starts when they're small children. And you miss one step, the next one will be more difficult. You miss another step, the next one will be more difficult. They build on each other. So don't be like, we have small children, we have time. No, 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 no. You have small children, now is when you need to be diligent about these things. Nobody enjoys spanking their children. Well, you know, you know it's not, it doesn't have to be an enjoyable thing. But it is something that is necessary to correct them and to get them to start to understand, to obey you, to control their emotions, and to think about other people. All right, so that's the Bible. That's my balance. That's my example. That's, that's my paper airplane for you tonight. And, you know, you can, you can take it or leave it. Say, I don't like your paper airplane. Well, you know, look at somebody else's paper airplane then. At least pick a plane that flies. Look at somebody's plane that flies and go ask them, how did you get that plane to fly? Because they struck the right balance here and they interpreted the Bible correctly. And they were diligent in raising their children and teaching them what the Bible says and not being hypocrites. And, you know, that's my paper airplane. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.